Good evening, ladies and gents, and welcome to a Thursday night edition of the Big D Podcast. Before I reel in tonight's guest, please subscribe, like, comment, share, post, or talk about the Spunky Spectrum Sports YouTube page. Tomorrow we've got Olympic podcast. We've got an Olympic hurdle at one o'clock and then two race walkers at six. So please tune in to that. So uh, I don't know if I could, if I should say strong in or uh, maybe boating <laughs> into the episode tonight or two of my favorite people on the, well, uh, if you know me, you know, I went to, you know, I am a passionate FGCU fan. I went to FGCU for my bachelor's degree in journalism and uh, lucky enough to have one of my favorite basketball players join oh, me tonight, yeah. Haley Whitaker. <laughs> and uh, she's not the only athlete in her family. Uh, her husband, Jake, is a if you've ever heard of the Bass Master Series, where Jake actually competes against some of the best bass fishermen in, in the country and the world, right? That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. You got it. You nailed it. Oh, great! I thought I was about to. I thought I was. <laughs> I thought he. I thought the fish just ate my sinker. No, <laughs> you got it. You nailed it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm part of the Bass Master Elite Series, which is a professional fishing. Uh, league and um, I get to travel around all across the United Set United States to uh, different lakes to fish for for bass um, and it's man it, it it's a really fun deal it's uh, it's challenging at times obviously because we you know all these different places that we go present different situations and and uh, you know but uh, you know being able to travel around and see all these great places that America has to offer and be on the water while doing it is is really cool so what led you to become a, to what led you to try yeah so that's a great question so uh so growing up I, I grew up here in western north carolina um and uh my dad he was always uh an outdoorsman sportsman uh, he loved to hunt and fish um but he introduced me to fishing uh gosh when i was probably five or six years old but that type of fishing was a little bit different from bass fishing. We did a lot of trout fishing in the little streams and rivers here in Western North Carolina. And that kind of, that passion kind of evolved and grew into uh, bass fishing, what I like to do now. Um, and my dad kind of got me started in the bass fishing uh, when I was, I think 12 or 13, started fishing little local tournaments with him, uh, fished with him all throughout high school. Um, and then I actually, uh, after high school, attended UNC Charlotte, uh, where they have actually a bass fishing team. Um, and I was part of that there at UNC Charlotte. Um, and in 2015, while I was at Charlotte, uh, my partner and I actually won the College Fishing National Championship. And that kind of sparked my uh, interest in actually pursuing it as a career. And, you know, here we are few years later. Uh, this is my fourth year. We're about to wrap up my fourth year on the Bassmaster Elite Series. And uh, it's been it's been fun. So tell us the difference between bass fishing and trout fishing. Okay. Uh, so like I said, trout fishing um, actually occurs more in like your, your smaller streams and rivers. Um, not to say that you can't catch some trout in certain lakes throughout uh, the country because you can, um, but the trout fishing is more of your, you know, you're using your fly rod or, uh, you know, your smaller stuff in your streams and rivers and bass fishing is mostly more of your lakes and your larger bodies of water throughout the country. But, uh, you know, kind of use the same, you know, uh, baits and tactics. Um, you know, I use all artificial lures, um, and then, but, but kind of growing up with my, with my dad fishing for trout, we used like uh, night crawlers, wax worms, uh, stuff like that. So I don't get to use that now uh, while I'm bass fishing, but uh, I would say the biggest difference between the two is actually just where you find trout versus where you find bass. So uh, when you start on the Bassmaster Elite Series, what were some of the challenges you faced? Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. So um 
it, it, yeah, just like, but for anything, when you're new to a, a league or you're coming in, you always, you know, you're considered a rookie. So you kind of, kind of grow up. There's, you know, yeah, you got to prove yourself. Um, and, you know, it, it's difficult because those guys that I was fishing against my rookie year were the best in the world. You know, those are the best uh, 100 anglers in the world. Um, and, you know, you, you qualify and everything is great, but then once your first tournament rolls around, it's like, oh, my goodness, here we go. We gotta, we've got to prove ourselves. So, um, you know, just – but I, I would say the biggest thing that I've learned uh, through that is, you know, just – be myself, do what I like to do, uh, and don't worry about the other guys. So, um, you know, I, I've, I've done well in several tournaments, but yet I've, I've struggled in some tournaments. But uh, we're always learning and, and trying to do our best to, uh, you know, be prepared for the future. You know, it's interesting. Like other sports, uh, it's interesting because you think of a sport like basketball and shoes and a basketball would be important, but in, but in bass fishing, the boats as much, if not more important than anything, because having a fast boat can get you from one place to another. Quickly. That's correct. Yeah. So my boat is essentially my office. Uh, that's where I, you know, I travel to and from my fishing spots on the lake in my boat. Um, I've got, you know, fish finders <clears throat> that allow me to help, you know, help me find fish and find fishing locations. Um, so yeah, my boat is, is essentially, like I said, my office, my most important tool uh, that I have that allows me to succeed. Uh, how important is speed for a boat? Because obviously if you get, because how long your days, what, five, six, seven hours? Eight hours. We usually yeah. fish from seven, from around seven o'clock in the morning till three in the afternoon. But to get to your question about your my boat speed, um, it is important, but then again, it's not important if you, and I'll, and I'll explain why. Um, yes, I want to get to my fishing location first. And, but the good thing about bass fishing in the lakes that we travel to is they're so big that very rarely, it, it happens sometimes, but very rarely do you find, you know, the same spot as somebody else. So, um, yeah, there's going to be times where one or two other guys may find the same area that I want to go to. But the, but the lakes, they're so big um, that when, that when that is the case, usually uh, I can either go to another spot or they go to another spot or um, – you know, so there's not really, you know, it's not, it's not imperative that I have the fastest boat on the water. But luckily, I do have a, a fast boat. I have a Phoenix bass boat. Uh, Phoenix is the brand that I run, and it is a very good boat. It's a very, it's a fast boat. Um, but it's a, uh, you know, it's like I say, it's my office, and uh, you know, I, I enjoy working out of my office. So before each day, do you have do you have a sort of set game plan for like where to fish and like where to get the biggest fish? That is, you are exactly yeah. For, well, that's the goal. That's the goal. So um, the way our tournaments work, uh, I actually get three days of practice. Uh, so which those days don't count towards the event, but they they're just practice. Um, so I get three days. The way our tournaments work is we practice on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then the tournament will start on Thursday. So getting back to your point of having a game plan, those three days of practice is when I try to formulate a game plan and, you know, find a place to fish. And hopefully by Thursday, the first day of the tournament, I have a good solid game plan and I know where and how I can catch some fish. So, uh, what would so what would be a really good score for like a good day of bass fishing, or would it depend on certain day? A certain day, like would it yeah. Be so, okay, that's another great question, and I'll go and I'll, I'll explain a little bit further into how our tournaments work. So, uh, I mentioned we get three days of practice. Our tournament days start on Thursday. And the tournament runs through Sunday. Um, our tournaments are very similar to golf in the aspect that we have cuts throughout the, you know, throughout the tournament. So 
our tournaments, everybody, all 100 anglers are guaranteed to fish Thursday and Friday. And then after Friday, they cut to the top 50 to fish on s Saturday. And then after Saturday is over, top 10 fish on Sunday. So how do, how do we get to the top 50 and the top 10? The way it works is I try to catch the five biggest bass that I can each day. I can catch more throughout the day. Uh, so on my boat, I've actually got two live wells that I can fill the boat up with water and keep those fish in the boat, keep them alive, keep them well. But I can only keep five at a time. And at the end of the day, like, so if I catch six, I can take the bigger ones and cull out the smallest one so I still have five. I can throw him back in the lake. So at the end of the day, everybody brings their five biggest bass in and we weigh them on a scale and your, your cumulative weight is what, you know, how we determine our standings. So it depends on what lake we're at. Um, some tournament venues, some lakes uh, have bigger fish. Some tournament lakes have smaller fish. So it really just depends on where we're at. Um, what what you would consider a good day. Uh, I will say your average fish uh, that we see, you know, I guess throughout the country, an average size bass usually runs somewhere around three pounds. Two and a half to three and a half pounds is the average size fish. So if you catch anywhere from 13 to 17 pounds, uh, you're, you're probably gonna have a very good day. Um, now, again, like I say, in some instances, you know, it may take a 20 pound average to do better, or it may only take 10 pounds to do good. It just depends on where we're at. So, um, like, uh, have there been any circumstances where you've like run up against the clock? Because I've heard of instances, especially with the, some of these Bassmaster Elite tournaments where guys have actually not made, not made the time limit. Unfor unfortunately, that that happened to me this year. I, oh no! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> time it will ever happen. The last time. and it cost me a lot of money, Dylan. Yeah. So it won't happen again. So go ahead. Go ahead. Um, again, like I said, we our, our tournament days usually last somewhere from uh, seven o'clock in the morning till three in the afternoon, and we're due <laughs> in uh, at three o'clock. And if you're not in, there's a guy sitting there counting, and, and if you're late. Uh, you get to get a penalty, so you get one pound penalty per minute you're late. So okay. if I'm if I if I'm doing it three o'clock and I come in at three o three, I lose three pounds off of my catch. So if you're fifteen, if you get to be fifteen minutes late, uh, you're dead. You're dead. Yeah, you're, you're count, dead. It doesn't matter if you caught fifty you're pounds. Your count, <laughs> your catch doesn't count. You're and swimming upstream. You're swimming upstream then. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I got mixed up with a with a time that I was doing at one of my tournaments this year, um, and it and it cost me a little bit. But yes, the time is certainly a factor, and uh, and I, I I promise you, I will never be late again. <laughs> I got Haley threatened me with my life when I. <laughs> Not when I came in late, so it won't happen again. I promise. So, so talk <laughs> about some of your successful tournaments. Yeah. So, oh gosh, I have finished. Um, how many times have I finished in the top ten or top five, Haley? I've, I've probably last year you finished top five three times. Yeah, I finished in, in the top five three times last year. Top six this year. Um, I, I've got one top top ten this year. Um. And I was rookie of the year, my rookie year. So that was a good accomplishment. By um, I've made the classic three years in a row. So that, that's another good accomplishment. But, uh, you know, this sport is full of highs and lows. This sport is actually uh, a sport where you lose more than you'll ever win. Um, so, and, you know, just because you lose doesn't mean that you technically lose. You just don't win the tournament. So anytime that I can finish in the top 10 of a tournament, that's actually a very good tournament. It's a very successful tournament. Um, so yeah, everybody wants to win, but in this sport, uh, there's only one winner per tournament. So uh, just, be just because you don't win don't, doesn't mean that it was a failure.
in many ways, in many ways, golf and fishing are the same thing. They're exactly. I love to uh, I love to compare the two sports when people ask because, I, like I say, most people have, you know have watched golf or understand golf, and uh, you know if they're new to bass fishing, I always compare our sport to golf. So, uh, like golf with its four majors, to tell us about the uh, Bassmaster Classic. The yeah, so of it. That's Bass that's Master. correct. You're exactly right. The Bassmaster Classic is essentially the Super Bowl of bass fishing. Uh, it's something that all anglers uh, throughout the year, um, you know, w based on where you finish in each tournament, you, you accumulate points. So, uh, you know, the top 40 in the points uh, qualify for the Bassmaster Classic each year. And like I say, there's 100 anglers. So, uh, you know, you'd think the top 40 would be easy to do, but it's not easy at all. So, um, you know, being able to qualify for the Bassmaster Classic is a huge accomplishment. We actually just got back just a few weeks ago. We were there in Texas. Uh, we had the Bassmaster Classic on Lake Ray Roberts, just north of Fort Worth. It was an awesome event. I think, uh, we, uh, I think Bassmaster said that that was the second most attended classic they've ever had. So a lot, a lot of people were there. Um, it was just, a, it's, a, it's a really good time. There's a lot of media there. There's a lot of attention on us anglers. And it's, uh, it's really, a, it's, a, it's a good time. Yeah, and uh, I think you finished 46, if my memory. Ended, I ended up 46. Not my best performance of the year, but. Uh, again, we qualified. We were one of 54 guys uh, to make the Classic this year. So, uh, you know, again, not my best performance. We're going to improve on that hopefully in the future. But, uh, you know, just to be able to be there and, and qualify for it. Uh, that's the goal. That's the goal. That's exactly right. Yeah, so now your next event is the is in Lake Champlain, New York, uh, July 8th through the 11th. That's correct. I'm actually leaving this weekend, leaving Saturday, uh, heading up there to upstate New York, a beautiful place. I, I've always, you know, when, if you've never been to the state of New York, New York, you kind of think of New York as being just the city, but that's not the case at all. Uh, New York is a beautiful state. It's full of uh, some great uh, natural resources, beautiful lakes, beautiful mountains. And uh, Lake Champlain is absolutely full of fish. So I'm looking forward to, to getting up there and seeing what we can catch. Where's the nearest city to Lake, to Lake Champlain? Oh, gosh. Um, there's really not many cities near Champlain. Plattsburgh is where our tournament's going out of. Um, Burlington, Vermont, I guess, is it's on the shores of Champlain. But as far as the cities of New York, um, I think Albany's maybe like an hour and a half, hour, hour to an hour and a half from Champlain. So, uh, like I say, it's very rural in upstate New York. Uh, there's actually Amish, the Amish com country up there. And yeah, Amish. Yeah, I was thinking that'd be Amish country up in like New York. Yeah, so yeah. No, it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I love going up there each year. Yeah, so we wish you all the best. Now, let's bring in Haley. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Haley played at FGCU from, well, from what, 20? 2013, 2017. Yeah. We cro yeah, we crossed, Haley and I crossed paths on more than one occasion. <laughs> so, uh, Haley, when you visited the campus for the first time, what did you think? Uh, this is a long way from home. <laughs> so we, my parents, we actually flew down one weekend. Um, love the co the coaching staff. That's really what drew me in to FGCU. Um, you know, a winning program, good coaching staff on the beach. You can't really ask for much more. Uh, I wanted away from home. The mountains, I love the mountains. I'm back in the mountains. I will never leave the mountains again. But I knew that for myself, I needed to go and do something different. So I packed up, went 12 hours away, love the beach, miss it all the time. Love when we go visit, but um, the mountains are home. <laughs> yeah, so uh, talk, to, talk to you about your early days at FGCU. They were rough. I remember my first workout, it was me, Morgan, and Randa, and I threw up. 
in the parking lot. And I was like, uh, Morgan, you're going to have to go get the car. <laughs> um, I think I still had PTSD from running the mile. I don't know what it was. I hated the mile. And Carl Smesco made us run it all the time. Um, uh, let's, a lot of shooting workouts. Yeah, it was every day in the gym, shooting, shooting, shooting. <laughs> I've got well, two things. One, how, fa how fast was your mile? And, tr and two, how fast did Carl Smesco want you to run that mile? Oh, Carl wanted me to run a mile in about two minutes. But <laughs> <laughs> I think our goal, was it six minutes or 6.30? One of the two. Um, and I would never make it when we ran as a team. I don't know why but I would never make it. And then, you know, after running it about 20 times, I would be like, okay, can I just go run it by myself? So I ran it by myself a couple of times and made it. Um, I don't really remember what my exact times were, but trust me, it was like barely making it. <laughs> <laughs> like a few seconds. I want to say it was like 6.30 that he wanted us to run it in. Yeah, let me attest. I let me attest. I run five Ks and I've never run a six thirty mile. It was awful. I have, I have nightmares about it. I still have anxiety when I see baseball fields that resemble FGCU because that's where we ran the mile around the baseball field. The sprinklers that smelled like sulfur water would come on at like six oh eight, and we would run it at like six a.m. So if you didn't make it, you were gonna smell like sulfur the rest of the day. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> you should you should have you you should have bought the cross cross country coach doing your mile. Yeah, yeah I should have. Right. <laughs> yeah, can I give can I give Coach Cassandra Goodson a call now? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah he should have. So um, uh, so you registered your first year at FGC. So when you actually got the chance to play, what were your thoughts? Um. I remember, I believe we were in Ohio and it was a tournament. Um, we weren't, I don't want to, we, we won, but we weren't doing well. And Carl put me in and I was like, this is your chance. And I ended up just kind of being the spark for that game. Um, gave the girls like the little offensive boost that they needed. And that kind of gave me an opportunity and more chances to play from then on out. Um, in college basketball, you know, you have to earn your respect. Um, so if you're not producing, you're just not going to play. That's all it was. So, like I said, that was my time. That was my opportunity. I took it. I made the best of it. And then from then on out, you know, Carl started giving me more and more chances to prove myself. Yeah, because it seemed like every chance, every game I saw you play, you were getting, like, more and more playing time. And you were producing, whether it be – three in, shooting threes, boxing out, doing the little things. Yeah, yeah. So you definitely have to produce the play there. <laughs> yeah. You're not producing, you're yeah. not playing. <laughs> and if you're not playing defense, uh, you're not playing either. Yeah. Amen to that. <laughs> so uh, you so you and I were at FGC when the Eagles won their first uh, NCAA tournament game. I can remember like it was yesterday, 2015 against – Oklahoma State, which beat a which yeah. beat TCU the year before Thank in that crazy you. 2014 opening round game. So tell us about that. Um, yeah, so like you said, they beat us the year before. Um, it was just kind of I remember that game. They had this girl and she was not a known shooter. And if you know Carl Semesco, then you know his game plans are super detailed, um, down to the core. If you follow it, you have the best chance of winning. And for this, our game plan for that game was, you know, we were going to allow that girl to have shots. We weren't really concerned because I think she had made like two or three on the entire season. And she lit us up. I mean, she was knocking them down left and right. And we, we were just like, this is, this is ungodly. Like, what is going on? You know, you've made three all season. And I, you know, you've knocked down seven threes here. So. Are you, are you thinking of the same gal I am, Rodriga, Rodriga Patton, who shot eight of 16. 
Probably. I can't it's remember. Five of eight of three from three point land for 23 points in that game. She yes. was running threes. She was running threes. Yeah, we definitely were not running threes that game. She was. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we stuck to our game plan, and, you know, it still gave us the best chance to win. Things like that just happen. That's just sports. You know, you can't control everything. But it definitely gave us, um, you know, the – what's the word I'm looking for? Like, next year we definitely wanted to come back and beat them. Uh, you know, it kind of lit a fire up under our rear ends, and we wanted to get revenge. So, and yeah, we did what, it. what is it? Revenge is best served is best served cold. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So, um, yeah, and then I was thinking the next game you got to play FSU in Tallahassee, and well, we yeah. all know how that <laughs> didn't work out too well. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> truthfully, what I remember about that game, they had a packed house, and they were all doing you know, their little tomahawk chop. Yeah. And it, <laughs> it was the coolest slash scariest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it, it Be honest, it was, be honest, I've seen a few FSU games down in person, but on TV, of course, and that tomahawk chalk is so synonymous with FSU, but if, yeah. you, if you're not rooting for them, uh, it gets it's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> it is intimidating. Yeah, and so uh, obviously we all know what happened in FSU kicked all butts. I can remember watching that game at Alehouse just down the street from me, and uh, I'm like, oh gosh, this game is this game is ugly. Yep, <laughs> it was not the best game. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, Obviously, lessons learned, and uh, there were a bunch of great players at FGCU during those years. Uh, I don't know, did you ever play with Sarah Hansen? Like, I did my freshman year. Oh, yeah, bec oh, yeah, it was the year that I redshirted, but yes, I played with Sarah. Um, and then her brother Daniel, um, he was one of our managers while I was there. So Daniel and I became really close. Yeah, so then you played with uh, Whitney Knight, you played Jenna Cobb, and then um, Daitisha Di Dunson, Kanisha yeah. Atwater, and then a couple of my favorite people, uh, Jessica Quintani and Jamie Gleason. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. Jess and James. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> CY13, Rubies for Life. <laughs> And uh, I'm trying to think, uh, in 2016, you didn't make the NCAA tournament, but you got to play Michigan in front of a packed Elite Arena. And I think that might be the last time I've ever seen Schmesko wear, Coach Schmesko wear a tie. Yes, yeah. He is very superstitious about what he wears on game days. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that year, you know, we didn't make the NCAA tournament. But we made the best of it. We went to the finals of the WNIT, and we went all the way to South Dakota. And let me tell you, there's nothing in South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> but that was actually a really cool game. Um, yeah, that was game was uh, that game was before the final four on the CBS Sports Network because I watched that game and and I knew as soon and be honest, as soon as I saw Whitney Knight foul out, I'm like, oh gosh, she just fouled out of her last college game. I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was you know, FGCU, the culture there, women's basketball, it doesn't get enough recognition. Um, a lot of people give women's basketball a hard time. But that was the best thing about playing at FGCU is, you know. It was more than women's basketball. We averaged like 2,000 fans a game. And most of the time when we would travel, we would have more fans than the home team. Um, so, you know, just our fan base was super supportive. It was fun being able to play in front of a crowd like that. Um, that'll get any team pumped up to be able to play. Speaking of a crowd, uh, the next year you got to play Miami in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And – Holy cow! Was that a crazy game? I mean, they. I mean, I don't know how many people FGCU brought, but it seemed like yeah. they brought like the whole. It seemed like they brought half the university there. I remember they had fan buses that drove down, um, you know, all of our 
season ticket holders, they were all there, family. It was it was a good game. <laughs> Not you know, the ending wanted, yeah. but a good game. <laughs> and you know who else was there? You. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I wonder why. I wonder why. I, I wonder why. So, so, I think I've got a picture of you, Taylor Karadajan, and yours truly <laughs> that we took while watching that first game. I'm trying to remember who was, who was that first uh, game. It was Quinnipiac and... Marquette, maybe? Maybe. I'm trying to think. I think it may have been like Quinnipiac and Marquette, but... I think you were right. I think it was Marquette because Quinnipiac ended up winning. Yeah, because it was like a Marquette missed a shot at the buzzer. Yeah. But, yes, that's a good picture. Hey, Dylan, I've got a question for you. Okay. Do you know how many women's basketball games, Florida Gulf Coast women's basketball games that you've been to? And do you still go? Uh, I, I, should, I didn't go this past year, obviously, because of the sure, pandemic. Right. But I've been, uh, I couldn't tell you how many games. You've I been to a bunch. <laughs> I hear you. <ya. laughs> Yeah, it was. Yeah, Marquette, Marquette and Quinnipiac. Yeah, my memory is memory. dead on the money. Good memory. So, uh, obviously, when the game I remember is uh, FGCU in Miami, and uh, be honest, that was one of the craziest games I have ever seen in person of any sport. Yeah. Uh, that was a good game. I, it's it's kind of sad, though. Your adrenaline gets going, so I only remember parts of it. Uh, I do, too. I do, too. Radigen knocking down a clutch three, and I remember going over there and just grabbing her head and kissing her because <laughs> that's when we knew, like, guys, we, we can do this. Um, and, you know, refs don't make a ball game, but I, de I definitely think the – refs had an impact on that game um one of our last you know last minute plays i think the refs kind of dictated how the game was going to end but uh, yeah maybe on both and maybe on the last couple of plays because it was tied game at 60 and miami inbound the ball and literally they I don't, I don't know what I could say. They committed pass interference, holding, illegal contact. <laughs> yeah, but like I said, and, there's other plays in the games that make an impact, so it doesn't boil down to that last one. But like I said, I do think the refs kind of dictated how they wanted it to end. <laughs> Or maybe, yeah. not, or maybe not dictated how to end. Like, <laughs> we're not going to call anything. Yeah. Yeah. Because I can remember my mom's – I can remember, like, the ESPN broadcast saying that could have been an offensive foul or potentially a flagrant foul, which would have meant two shots and the ball. You would have been – you could have been up two with the ball and little to no time left. And then the end of the game – in the end of the game, I remember because I think you won the game. I don't know if the play – I don't remember the play was for you, but Smetsu got a great play, and they clearly fouled you. And guess what the refs did? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, I actually think it was with Jordy. Uh, Jordy, yeah, Jordy Alexander. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the play exactly, but I do remember that the, flat, the foul was – on, you know, against Jordy. <laughs> the foul that wasn't a foul. The right? foul that wasn't a <laughs> foul, yes. yes. <laughs> and unfortunately, Miami advanced, and then I think Marquette ended up being Miami in that tournament, but that's a story for another day. So, that's right. <laughs> and so, uh, obviously, I knew that was your last game because you were actually – getting ready to go into dental school, but then you change into nursing. Correct, yep. So I did an accelerated nursing program, um, and I finished that, and now I am an operating room nurse. So I'm in surgeries all day, every day. I'm trying to think, like, what's the longest day you've ever done? For surgery? Yeah, it's the longest day you've done consecutively hour-wise. Oh, heaven. So, fortunately, 
I, I only work eight hour shifts. Um, I have worked up to, I want to say 13 hours one time on call, um, in a day, but typically I will work anywhere from eight to 10 hours in a day. Um, I have surgeries, like for example, one of my surgeries today, it lasted five and a half hours um, from start to finish. So that was one of our longer ones. And then we have other surgeries that, you know, 15 minutes and we're done. So. How, how has the pandemic affected you? So, you know, I was never on the front lines of COVID. Um, there, you know, God bless the nurses that were, but COVID still did impact the OR. So the OR, you know, it's a locked unit. We were kind of, um, you know, on our own. We did have COVID patients come in who needed emergency surgeries. Um, we have seen an increase during that time of, you know, bronchoscopies, um, where we go and, you know, take a look at lungs and stuff like that. So... There was an increase, but we were not dealing with COVID day in and day out. Um, it has affected how we screen our patients, um, how we, you know, wear proper PPE when we intubate patients and things like that. But overall, I would say the OR probably experienced the least impact of COVID-19. Uh, thank God for all the frontline healthcare workers past year and a half they've been the real heroes of the COVID-19 pandemic absolutely and they are still dealing with it and still kicking COVID square in the uh, buttocks right yes you got, that. You got it <laughs> so thanks for uh, thanks for uh, coming on the podcast and uh, we wish you well Haley on in the operating room and Jake will be will be uh cheering every uh successful catch uh, next weekend Thank you so much, Dylan. Well, yeah, thanks for thank having you. us on. It was good to see you. Yeah, it was fun to see you. It's been way too long. Way too there long. There you go. <laughs>